Welcome once again to a informal theological discussion. Uh, we three guys are here to discuss Salvation Belongs to the Lord, an introduction to systematic theology by John M. Frame. That's our reference book. It's not the only book we're using, however. And tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 17, the first part, entitled Perseverance. Next week we'll do Glorification. So this chapter is entitled Perseverance and Glorification. So the question is, when God saves a person, is he saved forever, or can he lose his salvation? But before we look into the Word of God, Jeff's going to lead us in prayer. Okay. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather again this evening to study your Word, to study the great doctrines in the Bible. We pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us in our discussion tonight and that we might be able to bring out and discuss your biblical truth for our edification and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's begin with reading, reading the scripture. There's a scripture that sort of gives us an overview of God's work in salvation on behalf of sinners. It's found in uh, Romans chapter 8. And after Paul has discussed all these glorious doctrines of salvation, he's talked about election, he's, he's talked about justification and sanctification and glorification, and he comes to this passage. What then shall we say to these things? Excuse me, where are you? Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, you think, well, anybody can get against us. But what it really means is since God is so powerful and He is on our side, what can prevail against us? And the answer, it would be none. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how would He not also with Him graciously give us all things. In other words, God's already given us the greatest thing He could ever give, His Son. He gave Him up for us, and His Son gave Himself up for us. So if He's for us in this way, He's not going to turn against us. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect, God's chosen? It is God who justifies who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So God's undertaken all these actions on the behalf of His elect. He's justified us. Therefore, we are reconciled with God. We are, have a legal standing before God. And we cannot be condemned because Christ just died on our behalf. He's already borne the punishment of our sins in our behalf. And now He lives at the right hand of God the Father to make intercession for us. So He asks these questions. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So the love of Christ is expressed in this election, this incarnation, this death of Christ on behalf of us, his resurrection, His ascension, His intercession. Who shall separate us from the, the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Here's the clincher. For I am persuaded, I am sure, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If salvation is a work of the Lord, and if it's a working of the Lord from beginning to end, Will his work fail? Is his work subject then to the failure of man 
so that his own purposes are frustrated and those whom he has saved will not make it all the way because of sin or unbelief or some force against him. That's the question before us. If God has saved a person by his grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, can that person ever be lost? So what does the scriptures say? And upon what can we base our argument either for or against the proposition? You're asking us this question? Certainly I'm asking you. Well, people listening to us can't respond. <laughs> <laughs> they can send us a text. <laughs> one of the, one of the uh, great texts along the lines is uh, in Peter, uh, let's see, what is it? First or second Peter? Well, By his you can power, try them both. By his power he's kept us unto salvation. Uh, if you look in 1 Peter, there's a passage that's related. In 2 Peter, there's a passage that's related. And they both are in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, here it is right here. 1 first chap first Peter, chapter 1, uh, verse 4. He has granted us an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So mm -hmm. you can't get much more secure than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and up above it, it relates it to what? Election? To regeneration? Mm -hmm. For blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He's caused us to be born again. He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And goes on in the <clears throat> verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith, mm -hmm. the salvation <coughs> of your souls. So it's God that's guarding our faith. Mm -hmm. uh, our faith may seem weak at times, but it's God that grants us faith and keeps us in saving faith by His power. Mm hmm. Right. I think Peter was very solid about this one. I'm just looking at the Second Peter, first mm -hmm. chapter, uh, like, uh, f uh, verse three. Yeah. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, mm -hmm. through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. So basically, he's, obviously, he's, he's telling us what what promises, but also he's uh, kind of emphasizing because he's, he's, he used the word granted. I don't know what he used when he <laughs> wrote it in original language, but I'm pretty sure even uh, probably even stronger than that. But he is emphasizing that this is granted to us because not because of what we did, but because of His glory. So, His power. Okay, and if we continue reading in that passage, mm -hmm. it talks about our sanctification, sanctification. the power of the Spirit's working in us. Mm -hmm. But it concludes down the part part of it for whatever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, mm -hmm. having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former life. Mm -hmm. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Mm -hmm. For if you practice these things, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an inheritance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is the kind of passage that leads to the idea expressed uh, of, as the perseverance 
of the saints. So what does the term perseverance imply? Well, you, when you don't, when you get tired, you don't quit. You keep plugging ahead. That's basic okay. meaning in everyday life. To persevere, mm -hmm. keep going, mm -hmm. okay? You don't stop. Perseverance of the saints. Now that, that's what the heading of the doctrine is. But it could certainly carry other terms, and I really think uh, a better term would be the preservation of the saints, where the emphasis is more on what God is doing. Uh, now, he does it in man and through people, in that they are the ones who persevere, but they are sustained in their faith by his action, by his preserving them in the faith and in the walk of faith. Now, does that mean that they will never sin or that they're free of sin? So, let me get you. Salvation, God saves us. So, when he saves you, does he only forgive you of your past sins up to that point and then you have to start over again? It's just basically what happens. And then after that point, you've got to, to uh, be sure you walk the right the right way, the rock road, not fall off the path, or if so, then you'll perish, or when God saves us at the point of our salvation, has He forgiven us for all of our sins, past, present, and future? Because after all, when Christ died on the cross, none of us were alive at that time. We've had some 2,000 years of people coming and going. Uh, so, all of those sins uh, were future at that point, and when people come in to existence and they live, then sin becomes a continuous reality to them. Even when a, a person is a Christian, he does still sin. We talked about this when we talked about the doctrine of sanctification. So, will the sin of a Christians bar them from heaven? In other words, uh, are there certain sins, for instance, this might do this, but other sins you could get by? Uh, or is there a particular sin that if you do that one sin, then then you'll lose what you had? Uh, these are ideas that people presented, so I'm trying to fill you out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the overall clear teaching that we read in Peter 1, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, is that it's God and His power and mercy that brought us to salvation and keeps us there. So if that's the underlying truth these other particular sins cannot override that. Uh, we know that uh, the power of sin over us has been broken, but there's still remaining vestiges that hang on that uh, cause us to stumble and sin in our Christian life. Uh, but like here, another great text regarding mm -hmm. the security of the believers and found in John 10. <clears throat> John 10, uh, he says in verse 27, Gospel of John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Mm -hmm. All right, now, Jesus is speaking the truth, or is he not? He says he gives them. They don't earn eternal life. It's a gift, right? And they will never perish. Never. Even when our own sins trip us up, we're not going to perish because of that. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. No outside force, not even an inner force. Uh, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of, my, out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So the picture here, is that we're secure in the hands of Jesus and the Father. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't get any more secure than that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that the Holy Spirit's involved in all that, but it's expl explicitly stated here, the Father, Jesus and the Father hold us in their hands. So, in answer to your question, no, there's no particular sin that is wicked enough to cause us to lose our salvation. Uh, you know, okay, back Why to... Why is that? 
Because yeah. one sin will condemn us. Yeah. How many sins does it take to make us judge, make us uh, condemn before God? How many? Just one. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, for another thing. So now the Christian is sin. So how come how come he's not then condemned when he sins again? Well, his sins have been paid for by Christ. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because the sin's already been handled. Yeah. The Savior has already taken those sin punishment for Himself, mm -hmm. and He has granted us His righteousness. So the doctrine of of security, mm -hmm. the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, of the preservation of God with the saints, is grounded upon all these works of God that we've discussed beforehand, right? Upon God's election of grace, mm -hmm. of God's calling us through the gospel and, and bringing us a spiritual life so that we are awakened to our need, we repent of our sin, we turn from it and turn toward Him, we put faith in Christ, we call that conversion, mm -hmm. and then from conversion, well what happens? God justifies us, we're, we're just before God, we stand before Him righteous, we're legally righteous in His sight, but not only that, He gives us the Holy Spirit, He adopts us into His family, He sends the Holy Spirit to live within us, so that not only are we justified, but we have begun the process of being sanctified. We've been set apart by God and He continues to work in our lives until He brings us all the way to glory. Uh, the question, uh, when we talk about uh, eternal life, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they will never perish. And that's a pretty strong statement. Now, here's a question. Can eternal life be temporary? Uh, no. Eternal is eternal. Okay. So he has given us eternal. He's not saying, I will give them eternal life in the future if they persevere and finally make it to the end. That isn't what he said. He didn't say, I shall in the future give them eternal life if they believe. He said, because they believe now, at this point of belief, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And neither shall any person, any power, be able to pluck them, remove them from my hand or the hand of my Father. We've keeping them in our hand, safe and secure. This this could be a little off, uh, off topic, but it kind of Paul when he writes his uh, Romans, like at the end of chapter seven and then the beginning of chapter eight. Uh huh. Um, he says, starting from twenty one, chapter seven. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind mm -hmm. and making, him, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my memory. members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the bodies of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I might serve the law of God when my, within, with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation in, for, for those who are in, the Christ, in Christ Jesus. Basically, I think I would say, uh, of course, when we live here, well, we are not completely sinless, basically. We will stumble, some of us, into serious sins. Sometimes not so serious. I mean, every sin, however, is David serious. in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. yeah. major mess up. Major mess up. And what about Peter in the New yeah. Testament, major mess up? Yeah. But uh, when I mean the the transaction, I mean the payment that we uh, I think the the price that is paid to to buy us from the sin is so big that it is just we cannot easily like get out of that like it's, it's just it major. covers everything yeah it covers everything and uh there is no precondition basically if they do this i'm gonna save them or we, the only precondition we have is to to repent to you know to desire that basically and to to want to claim on him and he his hands are so strong to hold us like jeff said so um we're not like completely sinless obviously I mean, I personally have seen too many times, many countless times, but the, the you know the 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 price that we um, Christ Jesus paid for us, 
is just too grandest to even like I mean to to be temporary, and then it would be I mean it would be so sad to for that to be temporary payment. Just well, like you know, you have to go back to the whole work that God's doing on our behalf. Yeah. If He's given us eternal life, but to, to say that eternal life can be ended mm -hmm. is to say that it's not eternal. Yeah, eternal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not. So if it's endable, it's, it's you know, it's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And to say that He has died for our sins and taken our punishment. Now, either He did that or He did not. And if this punishment has been rendered, mm -hmm. you know, and we are freed from the guilt. Uh, and we will be freed from the power, then, you know, to, to deny this would be to deny the sufficiency, is what you're saying, of the work of Christ on our behalf. Well, let's uh, just maybe for the sake of, of a clear definition to those who might be joining with us. It says, in this chapter, we should consider perseverance, and he defines it the following way, the doctrine that this new life given to us in regeneration continues to the end, indeed to eternity, and glorification, which results ultimately in glorification, which refers to the consummation of human nature in God's image. Now we've already talked about terms, but let's just to be clear and, and to connect with what Mr. Frame is saying. In the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, there are other words that are used to describe this teaching. One is the term eternal security. You heard that term before? Mm -hmm. yeah. And a related term to that is once saved, always saved. Now some people have negative reactions to these particular terms and then go off on tangents against them uh, because they think that it means, well, a person can just make a decision for Christ to live any way they want. Mm -hmm. One, we're not talking about making decisions for Christ, we're talking about regeneration, mm -hmm. in which God gives us a new heart, mm -hmm. a heart that seeks after God, a heart of repentant faith mm -hmm. that clings to the Savior. So, you know, regeneration has occurred, and then justification is that. Just, God has justified us, and He sent His Spirit to live within us. So, you know, eternal security simply means it's a security that's eternal, it's not going to end. God's security is not here today and gone tomorrow, or it's not, I'll do this part and then you do this part of your security. That would not be a real security, would it? And once saved, always saved, is simply saying, well, when God does save us, He does a complete work. He's not going to let go of us. Now, there's a passage of Scripture, I think, that helps reinforce this. It's just singing in a hymn uh, often, and that's in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 16. And Paul is uh, giving some testimony about his own life and his own relationship of trusting in God, in Christ. And he says that, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in me, or in you, he's writing to them, will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. One six. So the day of Jesus Christ is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So Philippians 1, 6. Let me read it again. Let's begin at verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Right to the Philippian Christians. Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, when did he, they, he begin a good work with him? When they believed the gospel, he's mentioned to you before. He will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul's asserting that the work that God does in saving us through the gospel will be brought to its ultimate conclusion in the day of Jesus Christ. So, terminology. But there's another term that I mentioned earlier, and that's the preservation of the saints, which I think, in many respects, is the superior word 
to talk about this doctor, but we can actually legitimately talk about it uh, using all these different terms. And each term, you know, in a way can be abused if we, uh, if we seek to do that. I want to quote from uh, R.C. Sproul in his article on Tulip and the Reformed Theology Perseverance of the Saints from uh, Table Talk magazine. And he's writing about the perseverance of the saints, and so he says the following, I think this little catchphrase, perseverance of the saints, is dangerously misleading. Now, why would he say that? What do you think? Well, a person could get the idea, okay, I've got to persevere. I've got to hang on. I've got to, you know, I've got to have endurance. If I don't hang on, I may lose my salvation. And that's what people believe, the vast number of people believe that. Mm -hmm. right? So, the perseverance of the saints suggests, he says, that the perseverance is something that we do, perhaps in and of ourselves. I believe that saints do persevere in faith. And that those who have been effectually called by God and have been reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit endure to the end. However, they persevere not because they are so diligent in making use of the mercies of God. The only reason we can give why any of us continue on in the faith is because we have been preserved. So I prefer the term, and I agree with Sproul. That means he's on good ground. <laughs> I prefer the term, the preservation of the saints, because the process by which we are kept in a state of grace is something that's accomplished by God. My confidence in my preservation is not in my ability to persevere. My confidence rests in the power of Christ to sustain me with His grace and by the power of His intercession. He is going to bring us safely home. Now this ties in directly with the doctrine we discussed last week, which was what? The week before last, when we discussed it with Sanctification. No, after sanctification, we come across the doctrine of the assurance of the believer, right? Uh, if, if eternal security is not true, if the preservation of the saints resulting in their perseverance in the faith is not true, then you can never have full assurance, can you? You can only have a temporary assurance of life. Well, right now, today, I think I would, I would certainly make it to heaven. I think certainly, uh, because well, I haven't, to my knowledge, done a big sin, or because right now I still have faith. But you know, who knows? Something else happens. What will happen at the end? I don't know. You see, you can't have any real assurance. If you deny this teaching of God's Word, you are not one with assurance. Your assurance is very tenuous. So I think that's important. Uh, the confessional statements about the doctrines is very uh, informative, I think. Uh, I'm going to... Some people don't know where the, the idea of the five points come from. We talk about the five points of the doctrine of salvation or soteriology, uh, which would be more correct form. They come from the Council uh, uh, Synod of Dort, a meeting of the Reformed churches in the 1600s, uh, when there were a dispute arose among the Reformed, and there was a group of them who were having some second thoughts about some sections of the Belgian Confession of the Heidelberg Catechism. And so the Synod met, it was an international synod in Europe at that day, and uh, had delegates from England and France and all over, and they met to discuss and argue these uh, points of doctrine from Scripture. And at the end, they issued what's known as the canons, canons simply being a law or a standard uh, of, of faith, and here it deals with the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. So that's the terminology comes from them. And they begin in their articles by stating that the regenerate is not entirely free from sin. Uh, but it goes in Article 3 to say God's 
preservation of the converted. Because of these remnants of sin dwelling in them, what you were reading about in Romans 7, and also because of the temptations of the world and Satan, and those who had been converted could not remain standing in this grace if left to their own resources, God is faithful, mercifully granting them in the grace once conferred on them, mercifully strengthening them in the grace once conferred on them, and powerfully preserving them in it to the end. So, this idea of God's preservation of the regenerate and converted person, which is, enables them to persevere in their faith until the end. Now, there, there's an old hymn that has come back in popularity these days because it sort of has a new sound with some new singers called He Will Hold Me Fast, mm -hmm. which expresses this truth. Uh, when I fear my faith will go, He will hold me fast. It's a great and glorious truth. Uh, the assurance of the persever perseverance of the preservation is indicated in here and the certainty of this preservation. Uh, let me read that in article number 8. Let me go back to article number 6. God's saving intervention. For God who is rich in mercy according to his unchangeable purpose of election does not take his Holy Spirit from his own completely, even when they see fall grievously. Neither does he let them fall down so far that they forfeit the grace of adoption and the state of justification, or commit the sin which leads to death, that is, the sin against the Holy Spirit, and plunge themselves entirely forsaken by him into eternal ruin. For in the first place, God preserves in those saints when they fall his imperishable seed, from which they've been born again. Now, didn't we read that? By, in Peter? Was it, was it in your passage, Jeff? Uh, About the seed? Sure. Uh, first Peter, go back to 1 Peter. We're kept by the power of God, guarded. Isn't that that same passage? or are being guarded through faith for a self salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, but there's also the passage about the incorruptible seed that God places uh, within us. That's uh, Yeah, here it is. Okay, what is it? Well, I think that's what you want. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 You've been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Yeah, that's exactly it. We've been born again through the imperishable <coughs> seed, the seed that cannot perish. So that's what's been brought to you. For in the first place, God preserves in those saints when they fall his imperishable seed from which they've been born again, lest it perish or be dislodged. Secondly, by his word and spirit, he certainly and effectively renews them to repentance so that they have a heartfelt and godly sorrow for the sins they've committed seek and obtain through faith and with a contrite heart forgiveness in the blood of the mediator experience again the grace of a reconciled God through faith alone adore his mercies and from then on more eagerly work out their own salvation with fear and trembling in other words one who's born again of God doesn't just continue to live as if he didn't know God there is a change that occurs within him it's from the seed of God's word this imperishable seed planted in us in regeneration. God gives us a new heart. It's a fulfillment of the new covenant. So it is not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy that they neither forfeit faith and grace totally, nor remain in their den falls to the end. God works repentance in those who belong to him and are lost. With respect to themselves, this is not only easily could happen, but also undoubtedly would happen. But with respect to God, it cannot possibly happen since his plan cannot be changed. His promise cannot fail. 
The calling according to his purpose cannot be revoked. The merit of Christ as well as his interceding and preserving cannot be annulled, and the sealing of the Holy Spirit can neither be invalidated nor wiped out. Concerning this preservation of those chosen to salvation and concerning the perseverance of true believers in faith, believers themselves can and do become assured in accordance with the measure of their faith, by which they firmly believe that they are and always will remain true and living members of the church, and that they have the full forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Uh, I think it's a very good statement. Uh, and if you've never read the Counties of Dark, I encourage you to do so, because it can really help clarify some mis uh, misconceptions that people have. All right, well, let's look at further scripture proof about the doctrine that we're talking about. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 21 and 22, Jesus describes a period of persecution for the church. And here he has mixed a statement about how parents and children will be adversaries, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So here we have a statement about the perseverance enduring to the end. The scripture teaches that those who endure, who persevere. Salvation is for those who endure, who persevere. But scripture teaches that everyone who is effectually called, regenerated, converted, justified, adopted, and sanctified by God, will surely persevere to the end. Now, what scriptures lead us to this conclusion that they surely will persevere? And you went to John chapter 6, right? Or was it John 10? 10. 10. All right, let's go to John chapter 6. Maybe you can read for us, Ephraim. Chapter 6 of John, verses 39 and 40. Here we're talking about the will of God, the will of the Father. Chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lo lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who, who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. Alright, so what in this passage justifies the doctrine that if you believe in Christ, you will persevere, that God will preserve you? Where, what, where do you find that in this passage? Uh, this is the will of Him, first of all. He, it's His will. All right, it's God's will. So we're talking about the will of God. Mm -hmm. And the will is specified. What is the will? And uh, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. So, so what's he talking about there? I should lose so nothing of all that he's given me. Who are they? Whoever is saved through, you know, uh, so basically whoever comes to uh, God through Christ, uh, from the, like, through what is paid and... Uh, nobody would perish. Basically, he's uh, the people who accept Christ. All right. That. Now, can we go further than that? Uh, can we go back before that? Sure. What about John chapter 17? In John chapter 17, Jesus makes his prayer, what we call his high priestly prayer. He again talks about those whom the Father has given him. Verse 3, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay. Uh, I manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I've given them the words that you gave me. So he keeps talking about the people that the Father has given him. And he's given him, when did he give it to him? It's in eternity, right? 
So what, what's he referring to then? What is this? What the underlying teaching or doctrine is being referred to here? Election. Election. A people chosen of the Father and given to the Son from all eternity. For that people, he came into the world to bring about salvation. So, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but, what does he mean by that? That ultimately he will raise it from the dead on the last day. This is the will of my Father. He repeats, everyone who looks on the Son, which is where you were at, how, does, how do we know the elect? Well, in time they what? Look to the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. So, if you have believed in Jesus now, you cannot lose your salvation. And you can be confident, assured, that Jesus will raise you up on the last day. Now you already read John 10, 27-29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So no one can snatch a believer out of God's hand. Here's some other passages. We talked about these passages last time in the Doctrine of Assurance. Mm -hmm. What's the first one, Jeff? John 3.36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son uh, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. All right, so what does it mean here, obey the Son? What is that? means to submit to him. Now what does it mean in the context? Look at the context. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. So obeying the Son would be what? Believing. Believe, Believe in the Son. That's the obedience. If you don't believe on the Son, the wrath of God remains on you. Okay, John 5, 24. What does that say? Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. All right, what does 1 John 5.13 say? It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, so in these passages... Having eternal life is not talked about in future terms. It's talking about in present terms. In other words, when you believe on the Son, you have eternal life. You pass from death to life. You've gone from one kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of God's Son. So eternal life isn't something waiting to happen in the future. It's something that you have now as the seed of God within you that will never perish. Now, this is not the fullness of that eternal life. We know that because Christ is coming again. He's going to resurrect us from the dead. We will be redeemed, body, soul, and mind. The full, the complete human being will be redeemed and, and remade in the image of God in Christ. But here we have this promise. We have eternal life now. We can be assured of it. We already possess it. Okay? So, there's a connection between election, between belief, and between perseverance that results in the consummation. Now, we, we began our session this evening by looking at Paul's statement in Romans 8, which basically goes over uh, a, a brief overview about the doctrines of salvation that we've been talking about for several weeks now and mentions most of those doctrines uh, as, as it concludes with who can separate us or what can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is uh, the glorious truths
Now, another thing that we have that supports the view of eternal life beginning now and that will never cease is that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So there's a passage of Scripture again that sort of reviews all of these doctrines of grace and it's found in Ephesians chapter 1. Let's see what that says. Ephesians chapter 1. It begins at verse 3. And it goes on through verse 14. So let's, uh, let's read through it and we can take some turns. Uh, you can begin, Ephraim, with verse 3 and 4, 5, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as He, close, Chose. As he chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we shall be holy and blameless before Him. So that's what? He chose us. He chose us. That's what doctrine? Election. Election, okay. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. To the praise of His glorious grace. All right, so what doctrine is that? Glorification. Predestination. Predestination. Oh, I'm sorry. Of election and yeah. predestination. predestination. They're related, but they're not the same. Correct. Election is the choice. Predestination is the destiny. Okay. With which He has blessed us in the Beloved. And who could that be? Christ Jesus. Okay. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace which He lavishes upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of all His will, according to His purpose, which is set forth in Christ, as planned for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Okay, so now that's the doctrine about redemption, mm -hmm. which results in the forgiveness of our trespasses, mm -hmm. which He's lavished on us. Okay, Jeff, in verse 11. In Him we have obtained an inheritance. Who's Him? In Christ. Okay. Having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. All right, so we have the guarantee of our inheritance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that seems to be the same thing that Paul is referring to in Philippians 1 6, isn't it? We're being guarded and preserved. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter talks about it, and Paul talks about it. I know whom I have believed. Uh, okay. So, the seal of the Holy Spirit, this is the person of the Holy Spirit who has been granted to us. He's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, which is at the second coming of Christ, which would be the doctrine of glorification that we'll be looking at again. Okay. We receive the Holy Spirit at the beginning of our regenerate lives, and anyone who has the Holy Spirit has a guarantee of final perseverance. So all of this simply says that God completes the work He begins. He guards every believer to the end. 1 Peter 1, 5, by God's power, we are being guarded through faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, which is, this is a lot of scriptural evidence here for the doctrine of the preservation of the saints uh, via God preserving them and their uh, preserving in the faith that has been granted to them. They have eternal security because once God starts work, once saved, He will keep them saved and bring them to His final consummation. So how then 
can some people have the idea that people can lose their salvation? Where does this come from? Well, there are a few scriptures that are... Okay, there's some scriptures that are troublesome. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And there is this teaching of what we call apostasy. So, there are those who believe that apostasy, those who are guilty of the sin of apostasy, have their eternal life terminated. uh, If they are, they, you know, are on the road and they miss it. Now, when you look at these particular passages of scriptures, one of them is in Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, you can also maybe refer to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, Now, Hebrews is also full of statements about the security of the believer. So we have to see when the same author in the Bible is uh, using verses that you could go two different ways with, what is the controlling thought in the whole epistle of the Hebrews? And that controlling thought will help us understand the passages under consideration. So the controlling thought in the book of Hebrews is that we have a great high priest and that when we sin, we can boldly come to him and he so identified with us that he took on our nature in order to bring us to God, etc. So, without necessarily going into how we would deal with these particular passages, one idea is that they are referring to those who may profess outwardly that they are Christians, but are not true inwardly. One passage in the book of Acts would be where Simon Magus, uh, Simon the Magnificent, or Simon the Great, who was so attracted to the preaching of Philip and the miracles that accompanied his preaching that he wanted the power that Philip had. And he got in line when the apostles came down and laid hands on them, received the Holy Spirit. And, And Philip was there among all of them. But he was not a true believer, which is made very evident in Peter's remarks to him that, uh, you know, that his heart was not right before God. Uh, So, professing a believer uh, may not be a possessing believer. So that's sometimes the case. Uh, uh, Another way of looking at the passage is is how it's describing uh, the readers, or, or is he describing them as true believers who've not moved up into the inheritance that God has for them, such as Israel in the wilderness, or are they simply false believers, such as Judas Iscariot and the one that I mentioned, Simon. Uh, but in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is referring back to the Old Testament Israel as, as, the, as the model as the example, as it describes of the work of, of God among them. And in the book of Hebrews, these people that came out of Egypt, they witnessed the miracle power of God in providing them daily with manna and water from the rock, a cloud by the day and fire by night. But many of them, heart was not right with God. They came out, but they didn't true, have true belief in the God of Israel, even the God who was bringing them out of that particular thing. So, Hebrews 6, 9 says, even though he writes about these possibilities of these false believers, shall we say, there might be one interpretation of it, this is what he says about it. I am convinced this is not true of you. In your case, beloved, Hebrews 6, 9, the writer says, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. So the book of Hebrews, the author believes that the recipients, his readers, have regenerate hearts and true faith so that they are saved and will be saved in the end. And he knows that the apostles he's spoken of do not have the gifts of God sufficient for salvation. Now there are people who are what would be called nominal church members, people who don't really practice the faith, but who would say that they're, that they're Christians. This is not what we mean when we say that people are preserved by God and persevere in the faith because of it, because they're not showing any light with God. In the scriptures, those who preserve, no, those who persevere are those who are regenerated by God's Spirit, who grow in grace, 
and who are being preserved by God. Right? Uh, and you know that Jesus himself warned us uh, about wolves in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. So we sometimes refer to these as being who are, are hypocrites who are false, false followers of Christ. At any rate, this is the, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, or I think a better statement is the preservation of the saints by which they are they persevere or continue in the faith. A uh, favorite theologian of mine in the past years, uh, Roger de Cole, when he was discussing this particular doctrine, he gave it the title of indefatigable grace. Mm -hmm. The grace of God that never ends. And since salvation is by grace mm -hmm. through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a gift of God. It's indefatigable. Mm -hmm. It will never end. Mm -hmm. And therefore the the true believer, the one who is connected to Jesus Christ by faith, will never perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Now, this is what we call the doctrine of glorification that we'll look at next time. you have any further comments or remarks or questions well, or disagreements? <laughs> you know, all this is all tied together. Mm -hmm. All these great doctrines... Um, point to the preservation of the saints. For example, there's the election mm -hmm. in what we may call eternity past. So if God has determined before he created the universe, he's going to save certain people, uh, his purposes will not be overturned. Mm -hmm. And then salvation is totally by grace, not by our works or our righteousness, but by the grace of God. So the whole atmosphere, the whole foundation is of grace. Mm -hmm. So we're saved by grace, we're kept by grace. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, and then another related truth here is the, the regenerated heart. Uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit and mm -hmm. a, a believer gives him a, a magnificent power that he didn't have before. He's a new man or a new woman in Christ. So right. his heart is not to rebel against God, but to please God, and to please God out of gratitude. Uh, so this is a great uh, motivating, governing factor in our lives that uh, you know makes sin uh, abominable. For the most part, you know, we do succumb to it sometimes, but uh, the whole direction of our lives has been changed by the power of God. Hmm. Uh, from eternity past, we encounter the grace of God. It's a gift. Uh, you know, our sins, <clears throat> present, past, and future, if, if, our, if we realize that our future sins are also forgiven, I think that is... A motivating factor and to continuing to please God you know why even when we sin right yeah uh, so all these great truths are tied together you know I mean we're saved all three persons of the triune God Father Son and Spirit are active uh, in our salvation they take the initiative to save us and to keep us. So we're, we're kept in the salvation by the work of the triune God. Mm -hmm. So who is going to disrupt the work of the triune God? Even my sin is not going to disrupt the triune God's purpose to save me. No power outside of me, no power even inside me uh, can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, God's purpose to save a people for himself that they would be his people and he would be their God has been determined before the universe was created and he will bring it to pass and if we happen to be in that elect number uh, we're most blessed and most secure. How do we know we're in that elect number? Well, <laughs> we study the doctrine of assurance. 
last week. Because uh, we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. The simple answer is, is that we have the evidence because we have put faith in the provided mediator mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. Comments? You know, like uh, Peter, he says there in First Peter one that it's through the the resurrection of Christ. You're guarded mm -hmm. through the resurrection. So our our guarding is rooted in historical fact, mm -hmm. as well as in the great work of God. It's in the resurrection of Christ that uh, our justification was secured, mm -hmm. and uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out mm -hmm. by the ascended Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, so all these great truths about Jesus' work and God's purpose uh, are focused in on the believer and give us this eternal life. Let me read from a statement of faith that sort of summarizes these things. Uh, just a doctrinal statement. We believe that because of the eternal purpose of God toward the objects of His love, because of His freedom to exercise grace toward the meritless on the ground of the propitiatory blood of Christ, because of the very nature of the divine gift of eternal life, because of the present and unending intercession and advocacy of Christ in heaven, because of the immutability of the unchangeable covenants of God, because of the regenerating, abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of all who are saved, we and all true believers everywhere, once saved, shall be kept safe forever. Amen. We believe, however, that God is a holy and righteous Father, that He does not overlook the sin of His children. He will, when they persistently sin, chasten them and correct them in infinite love. But having undertaken, not, but having undertaken to save them and to keep them forever apart from all human merit, he who cannot fail will in the end present every one of them faultless before the presence of his glory and conform to the image of his Son. Mm -hmm. Thus, those whom the Father chose, the Son penally substituted for, and the Spirit set apart will never totally or finally fall away from the state of grace, but will persevere to the end. Amen. Therefore, we can have Assurance mm -hmm. that excites within God's children filial love, gratitude, and obedience. Mm -hmm. Well, that's our study for this week. Mm -hmm. And next we're going to look at the doctrine of glorification. Mm -hmm. Father, we just want to give you thanks that uh, you have revealed these great and glorious truths to us to strengthen our hearts in grace. Uh, to point our eyes toward you, your unchangeable purposes, and the great, sufficient, all-sufficient work of your Son in the redemption of our souls. So we give you thanks that you are the sovereign God of salvation. And we want to yield ourselves to be instruments to glorify you in this earth as your sons and daughters through the power of your indwelling spirit. We all offer this up to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.